I guess uh, welcome to the online training. Um, my name is Shazib Siddiqui. I'm actually um, um, going to walk you through um, in today's session about um, learning about Almod, and it's going to be a hands-on exercise. Um, just a quick introduction about me. Um, so I'm part of the NERSC uh, user engagement group, so UEG, so we help um, support the NERSC users, um, you know, with consulting uh, user tickets, documentation, and all sorts of stuff like that. Um, and um, for today, we're going to uh, talk about Almod because Almod is um, going to be the module system that we will have on Perlmutter. So as you may know, um, Perlmutter is like actually um, in the process of um, um, being configured uh, and in the coming months it will be available for the uh, general public. I'll show the slides in the bigger screen. You want me to make it bigger? Sure, I can do that. So just some logistics um, in order that um, everyone's aware. Um, when you join, um, just please keep yourself muted. Um, if you haven't already, I think I see everyone whose uh, name is um, there, but if you can please change your name to like something like the, your first name, last name, it'll make it easier for us to, to pinpoint who is asking a question. Um, I do see still some people that I don't recognize. Um, so if you could change that would be good. Um, the videos will be available at the nurse training events um, after the talk. Um, if you don't have a training account on nurse, um, you can apply for one. Just go to this link right here and use this four letter code AQLE and it will give you a temporary account that you can use to the NSSH and Kikori. Um, so yeah, so for today, um, if, so if you are a nurse user, um, you know, I might recommend if you can join the um, nurse uh, user uh, Slack and then there's an Elma channel that, uh, that we can use to post your questions. So make it easier for us to interweave questions and help everyone out. Uh, if you are not on the Slack, I mean, you can post your questions here in the Zoom chat and we'll monitor that too. Okay. So for today, um, the training is gonna be found on this, uh, on this link. I'm gonna show that in a, in a second. Um, so you can actually go there. And this will be a hands-on. So uh, what, what I'd expect is uh, we'll, we'll follow along. Uh, I will do the exercise on my side and um, I'll give you some time also to get set up and, and, and you guys follow along too. Uh, the training is gonna be uh, basically in a container. It's a Docker container. Uh, however, we can use, um, so um, Shifter on Cori, because that's, uh, that's the uh, container tool that we have. Um, so you, all you need is just to spin up the dock of the container um, and, and then follow the exercise. Um, however, if you if you don't have accounts on Cori, um, you can also just use Docker on your workstation and, and follow along. So that looks pretty easy. So to get started, um, I, I presume most of you have accounts on Cori. Um, if not, um, all you need to do is just connect to Cori. So that's just like SSH to Cori.nurse.gov and, and then um, that should be it. Uh, and then you can access it. So I'm actually on Cori. Um, let, let me actually go to the exercise. So the exercise for today, um, if you're not there yet, um, I'll give you guys some time. But the way it's structured is we will have four exercises um, cover the basics on uh, the module system. So LMOD, so we'll go over the module commands, uh, module ML, module veil, uh, load, et cetera. So like all the basic commands that you use to interact with the module system. We'll talk about the module collection. So this is a, one of those uh, new features that 
Uh, I mean, Almar has it for quite a while, but it's, it's something that uh, allows users to save um, modules into a user collection and then load all the modules together. Uh, we'll talk about the Almod spider utility and um, and then also finally talk about how we can write dual modules. Uh, we have a, a set of examples that are provided in this repo that we will review, uh, look at and see the available rule functions. So in order to get started, um, what you could do if you're on Cori, uh, you can just use shifter and, and then just copy this line and you'll just be in a container image that has Almod. If you are not on Cori and you don't have access and you have Docker, you can just use Docker run like this and then just get into the container. And uh, after that, what you should see an output, uh, if you do type module, you should see a function, a shell function, and then if you do a module version, you see uh, this is Elmod 831. So I'm going to give you guys some, some time. Uh, I'll introduce myself. Let's see, three minutes, and then we'll get started for the exercise. Okay. If you have any questions, please. So if you're on Corey, if you do exactly what I've done, um, we're in um, basically in an interactive container um, with a terminal. And you can see that you would see uh, this version of Elmod in the container. And this is what we will use in our exercise. So let me see. So if you if you are doing it on Cori, um, the one other thing that you'll have to do is obviously clone this repo somewhere. Um, so I have it cloned in my home directory, and yeah, I mean this is the repo, and then you can just navigate to the directory and then just source the setup script. And all that does is just um, exposes the modules that we will use in this exercise. What you should see is something like this. Okay, so I'm going to give everyone at least one or two more minutes. Um, once you're done, then what I would like you to do is go to exercise one. And this will just um, be an intro to the modules um, part one. And we'll go from there. Um, if you're able to get through, if you could just give maybe a thumbs up or, uh, or just a plus one or something in the chat, it would help to know if everyone's able to follow the instructions.
All right. Um, let me get started. Um, I, I think I see only two people that said yes. I'm hoping everyone else is able to join. Um, please do um, speak up now. All right. So we're going to give you a, basically an overview of um, um, modules. So the first thing that we'll talk about is how you search for modules. So in order to search for modules, um, there's two different commands, um, module avail and module spider. They both allow you to search for modules, but they, um, they, they work slightly different. Um, I already showed you the output of module avail. Uh, what it looks like is just a, a listing of all the available modules in your system. Right? Um, and, and, and basically what it does, it just shows all the modules in your module path. So module path is a environment variable. It's just a colon separated list of directories. Uh, that is uh, LMOD is reading and then reporting all the modules. The difference between module avail and spider is that you know, spider actually can traverse through the hierarchical module tree. So basically you can have module paths to other directories that are not shown uh, by module avail. And it, it, the output is also slightly different. So what module spider looks like is, uh, so I, I guess let's talk about module avail first. So module avail just shows you everything. You can also filter by a specific uh, like module, so say GCC. So just a key name, and then I'll show you all the available modules. <laughs> okay. Um, module spider. This is a command that useful if you want to see everything that's available in the system with like a, a list of the software and then basically a description uh, a list of all the available modules and a description if there is one and then you can use the module spider against any of the named version so let's say like for instance we have gcc 5.0 so we can just say something like this and then it shows you that what this module does. Um, it tells you if this module can be loaded directly or if it needs other modules to be loaded before it, and then just a help. Uh, so this is quite useful. Um, you can also, for instance, just do a keyword instead of a version and it will tell you all the available versions. So for instance, this uh, GCC has two versions, 5.0, 6.0. And then if you want a specific one, you can just do the version, okay? So that's basically what, what you have available to search for modules. Um, next, we're gonna talk about how you load and unload modules. Okay, so we're going through this section, so. So yeah, so purge, um, and then I'm going to GCC, and then if you do module. So module load is um, used to actually load a module into your user shell. And module list is showing you all the active modules in your shell. Okay. So it shows you that GCC 5.0 is loaded. Um, when you say module load GCC, uh, we actually have, if you remember, three GCC modules. We didn't specify the version. Okay. However, LMOD has to pick one of the defaults. Uh, the default is actually marked with the D. You can see that here. So in this case, GCC 5.0 is a default. There is actually many ways you can have a default. Uh, one of the ways you can have one is using a dot version file. So let me just see and show you what this is. So if you look into the, actually the directory where the module is, this is under the gcc.version. 
you're going to see this function called set modules version. It sets, it basically tells what the um, version uh, default should be. And, and this is a tickle style kind of, a, uh, you could say, function that Elmar understands. Uh, if you are interested, you can click on this link here, and it tells you what, um, how Elmar picks for module files. And if you go a little bit in the middle, it tells you about how to mark a version as default. So you can see here. Um, so one of the ways that you can do it is through a Lua file, module rc.lua. And you can use some function like this. One way is using a dot module rc file. And that's kind of similar to what you have there. Uh, or the fourth way is using the dot version file, which is what we show in here. And let's use something like this. Elmod supports the dot module RC or the dot module RC Lua file. Uh, and yeah, and also by default, it picks the highest version as the default if there isn't um, like any dot version file. So let's actually try to do something more. So let's just purge this little PGI. So if you do a module list, uh, in this one, we see PGI 18.1 uh, is loaded, 18.110. And if you do module vel and PGI, we see that there's two versions of PGI in here. Um, and the default is 18.10. If you actually navigate to this directory where these modules are, notice that uh, in this directory, we don't have any dot version or dot module RC or any other class. So LMOD by default will just pick the, the highest version if there isn't any of those. Okay. Uh, another way you can actually see all the defaults for a module is using module dash D. And this will show you the defaults for all, uh, all of the software. So you can see that PGI 18.10 and GCC 5.0 are the defaults. Okay. So let's just merge. Uh, so we can also load multiple modules. Uh, you know, you don't have to, you know, you're not limited to this one. So I'm just going to load PGI and Gaussian. The module list, you'll see um, both of these modules are in your user shell. Okay. So, so basically, right now, if you've got this far, you should be over here. Okay. Um, so we talked about module load, which loads modules into your shell. Um, you can also uh, swap out modules. Um, basically, uh, you know, a module that's it already loaded with another module. Um, so let's try one. So in this example, um, we're going to load Gaussian. Module list. We should see um, Gaussian Anaconda. Um, imagine we want to swap out Gaussian with uh, GCC. So you can do module swap. Gaussian and GCC. And if you hit module list, you will see that GCC is in your active shell after the swap and Gaussian removed from the shell. Okay. So swap is basically um, it only works if the module is in your uh, active. Uh, list of modules. You can't do a swap if a module doesn't exist. Um, okay. Uh, you can also use module SW or switch or swap. They're all basically alias. They're, they're all the same thing. But um, if you prefer one of the other. 
Okay, so now we will uh, talk about unloading modules. So let's. So uh, one thing that could be helpful, um, if you don't know, uh, LMOD has type completion. So it can really help you type. So yeah, so we can just remember that. Download, Gaussian, and then so I have three modules loaded, Anaconda, PGI, and Gaussian. If you want to, for instance, unload a module, let's say PGI, you just do module unload PGI. And now what unload does is just basically the inverse of, mo of module load. So we'll unload the module uh, from your shell and anything that was uh, invoked by it. Uh, and then if there were any also dependent modules and then we remove them too. Okay. okay. So let's, uh, I'm gonna purge my environment. So um, if you don't know what purge does, um, it basically removes all your modules. So if you do module list, you don't see anything. Um, this is what I had before. Um, when you do purge, you just uh, basically it's just unloading all the modules. So I'm going to load Anaconda 2 and PGI. Um, now, one thing that you may uh, be tempted to do is well, can, can I kind of load and unload modules in the same command? Uh, you know, if you were to use a module load, you you would not be able to do it. So let's just copy this line and then see what's actually going on. So if you were to try to do something like module load, something like Gaussian, but then you want to unload, let's say PGI, right? Uh, in some command line, um, maybe in the same line, you, you're going to get an error. And um, the reason why you get this error is Elma doesn't know the subcommand. Um, unload right here because it thinks it's a module right here and so it's trying to think well i'm going to do module load unload but it's not going to let you do that and so if you um and i do this quite often like if i have modules i want to load and unload i um the the, the way that you can get around this if you're doing it in like a in a single line uh, is using um, another tool called ML. Uh, this is a, um, a utility provided by Elmod, which mimics very much close to the module command. And however, the the syntax is slightly different. So let, let's actually talk about this. Um, uh, you, you can use ML to actually load and unload modules in the same um, command without having to do, let's say, module load Gaussian and then do module unload PGI in two separate commands. So let's purge and I'm going to load the same modules again. And then what we will do is we'll do ML Gaussian minus PGI. Uh, so I'll tell you what this does. First of all, um, ML uh, space, and then the, the name of the module is equivalent to module load Gaussian. And then a minus means it's equivalent to a module unload PGI. Internally, that's what it is. Um, however, with ML, you can actually do um, you can run both these commands together in one line. So if you do um, module list, what you should see is Anaconda and Gaussian, because we load Gaussian and then remove PGI, if you can see. Okay. So ML is just another um, shell function. It's slightly different than what um, 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 the module command is um, basically the LMOD dir is where your uh, LMOD installation is, and then there is a function called 
I mean, a script called ML command that LMOD reads to interpret and then evaluate each command. Um, there is another script uh, for a module. Uh, however, this looks for a command called LMOD command and then evaluates each um, command. But they are slightly different, but they they mimic very similar. Uh, so I'm going to talk about this over here. So if you didn't know, um, so module list is equivalent to ML without any arguments. Module avail is equivalent to ML AV. Module purge is just ML purge. Module load is just ML GCC. And the thing with unload is just a minus in front of the, the module that you want to unload. And then all the other uh, are just basically um, subcommands that are just tacked on. So module show is ML show, module restore is ML restore, ML spider, and you kind of get the idea. Okay. So let's actually uh, now use the ML command. Uh, this is um, by far probably uh, the most, uh, I guess, used feature that I have because um, it helps you save on typing. Um, and it has some features that, you know, uh, like the module uh, with the syntax module unload, and, you know, and that's kind of quite handy. So let's start. So I'm going to purge load GCC ML. So if you notice ML is showing you the same output that you would do with module list. Okay. So if you didn't know, uh, we're now almost at the end. So now we'll talk about how you load modules with ML. So I'm going to do purge and GCC. So ML and then the name of the module um, basically just loads it into your shell. Okay. So we can also do ML purge. That's the equivalent to module purge. Just right there. If you do ML, you see that there's no modules um, loaded. It's the same as module list. So it's, it's showing you exactly the same thing. And then, you know, if you were to do ML GCC and you know, to purge again, you would still see the same, same thing. So, um, I think that wraps up everything on exercise one. And that, I think we can proceed to the next one. Um, I'll give maybe one minute to, to see if any of you have any questions in the Zoom chat or in the Slack. Um, don't be shy. Was uh, everyone able to follow along in the exercise? So there's any issues in the minute? I see two thumbs up. Okay. Well, I don't hear anything, so um, we're gonna Go to the next exercise. Um, it's just going to be an extension to the first one. Um, and in this one, we're going to talk about um, a few things. We'll talk about how you can inspect a module file. Uh, we're going to talk about hidden modules, uh, how you can debug modules. Um, and then also finally talk about module collection. Okay. We'll talk about uh, how you can customize module path. And then uh, wrap up with the LMOD spider utility. Okay. Uh, so I think, um, yeah, so let's just get started. So um, if you want to inspect what a module file does, there is the module help. Okay. This will show you the output 
of the help section of the module file. This is just Anaconda 2, so you know, just has a, a link to what this software is. Uh, it's a data science toolkit. So um, module help is pretty useful. If you're unsure what it does, uh, just use module help. Um, or if you learn, you can also do ML help. It's the same thing. Uh, whatever, whatever works for you. There is also another uh, command called what is. So ML what is is just a, basically a single, uh, it, it's just a shorter description of the help. Uh, generally the what is is uh, like a single line and it, it, it's easier to read. Uh, whereas the help could be like a multi-line uh, string. Okay. So you can use either or. So the next thing that, uh, like, if you want to know what the module file is doing, uh, you want to use the module show. Okay. So what module show it shows you, if you look right here, it's going to show you the full path to the module file. So this is Anaconda 4301. It'll show you the content that is um, actually run when you um, load the module. So it shows you the help section. This is the syntax for how you write the help. Uh, but what is, and then it shows you that, um, I guess there's a function called family that it runs. We'll talk about this. So these are the commands that the module command is going to run. Um, now, note that this is not um, the content of the module file. Like if you were to just cat this file. Um, however, for this file, this is exactly the same content. Um, if you want to see the, the content of this file, I mean, you can just you know cat this file like this and see see the, the help. However, there is a more easier way to do this. So let me just do this. So ML uh, raw is an option, dash dash raw. And if you do that, it will show you the content of the, the module file. So let, let, let's just do something. So let, just to see a difference. Um, I think maybe I show um, Go. I think Go is different. So this is the show for Go. But if I were to do raw, this is the content of the module file. So it's it's different. Right? Uh, the content of the module file is different than what actually gets loaded in your show. So one of the one of the things that may be useful when you're trying to um, inspect the module file is actually use this ml raw command and try to make sense of it and maybe even pipe it to some um, uh, another Linux command to see something. So maybe like something like you want to grab the file. So if you do that, let's say, because I know in Anaconda 2, there was a, this family function. When you grab it, it doesn't, work correctly, uh, you see the content of the module file. And, and the reason is that the module command is redirecting uh, the output to standard error as opposed to standard out. That means that the pipe symbol is not getting the output of this command to grep, and there's nothing to grep. Uh, so one way to get rid of, uh, to work around this is there is a, um, a redirect option that you can use to basically tell Elmot to redirect the standard error of, I mean, the standard out to standard out, not standard error. So if I were to then run this command like this, you're going to notice now it works. Um, you don't see the content over here like how we saw before. Okay, so the redirect is pretty useful feature. So if you, you know if you do module help, uh, you can see all the available options. 
And yeah, see, so the redirect is just uh, it's just an option, but it, it it's only available for you know these. Uh, so this list avail spider and it works for shell also. So. So another way that you can actually do this is you can set the environment lmod underscore redirect equals true. And this will enable this by default, okay? Um, I would also recommend you read the lmod FAQ. It actually talks about some of these things. And um, yeah, it gives you a, a good explanation. So if you do lmod. Redirect. I guess. Yeah, so right here. You know, how do you force the output to standard out? So just set LMOD redirect. Uh, this could be done on the at each site as like a system wide, or it could be done at a user level through this environment variable. Um, or using the option dash dash redirect. Okay, so let's talk about some other things. So you can, um, so with module avail um, and spider and all the other commands, um, you see the output, but it's not like uh, in a machine readable format, that's something that you can parse. Uh, there is an option for that. Um, let me see if I have something. So let's just move DCC. So if I do dash T, it will show you um, the modules in, in, in a parsable format. So if I were, let's just do open API and dash T, it will, it will show you all in a list. Um, so this is pretty useful if you want to do some text processing. Um, this works also with avail. So dash T avail. Uh, the way output is, is, is the name of the module tree and then the list of all the modules. Uh, in this case, these are the name of the modules and then H, uh, there's a directory and then there's this module file. And it just be, basically keeps going on for every single module that you have. And the same thing works with spider. So it looks pretty similar. Uh, so yeah. So that's another useful one. Um, so now we'll talk about, uh, let's see. So, first so we'll talk about uh, uh, briefly about families. Um, so we've set families between uh, GCC and PGI. So as you know, GCC and PGI are compilers. So if you uh, if you were to purge and then load GCC and then load PGI, uh, what LMOD does is it automatically replaces GCC with PGI. Um, and we didn't do anything. We didn't do like a module swap or anything, but LMOD just did it automatically. And you may be wondering, how does this work? So, so the way um, these module files are written, there is a well, let's first look at them. So you can do ML dash dash raw show, and you can show multiple modules. In the GCC and PGI module, we have set a function called family. That is a name of a compiler. I mean, sorry, name of a family group. So the name is called compiler in both of the families right here. And what Alma does is it treats uh, modules of the same family as um, only one of them can be loaded at a single time. So when we loaded GCC, it was uh, already loaded, but then when we load PGI, it will auto swap uh, GCC with PGI. Uh, the other thing is that when LMOD uh, loads modules that have family, it will also set an environment variable LMOD underscore family underscore some name of the, uh, the family name, so the compiler. So if you do echo, compiler, you see PGI is loaded. 
Now, PGI is the value. Uh, there's also a version, um, a variable that points to the actual version of the module file. Right. So in LMOD, um, there is a configuration that actually tells this uh, auto swapping. So if you grep for this, uh, this auto swapping, yes, means that LMOD would automatically swap modules. So if you're, if you're, if you're unsure what, what I'm talking about, um, thank you. Let's maybe go to the, to the documentation. So if you go into, yeah, yeah, configuring LMOD. So if you go into configuring LMOD, this just shows you all the environment variables that, uh, that we we're talking about. And LMOD auto swap is one of the environment variables that can be overridden by environment variables. And this basically says you can allow LMOD to swap any modules that uses it's the family function, such as compilers and PI stacks. Okay. Um, so that's what that is. And if you're not sure about what the, the LMOD functions are, let's go to this one. This shows you a list of the Lua functions. We'll have to talk about these uh, in the fourth exercise, I think. This is what we're talking about. We're using this function called family. And this is basically you can only have one family. In this case, the, the family name is called name loaded at a single time. So if you said family equals compiler, then that would mean only one compiler is loaded. Okay. So, so let's try. Um, so another thing that Alma does is it automatically swaps modules of the same name. So uh, let's say because we have two versions of GCC, I guess in this case, 5.0 and 6.0, if I load GCC ML, and then if I want to load GCC 6.0, Alma automatically swaps uh, 5.0 with 6.0. And you can see that here. Um, this is also another uh, configuration that, I mean, that could be configured at your site. Um, basically it's called disable same name auto swap, right? Okay. Um, if this is set to no, then modules, um, That, yeah, the, basically what it means is that the same name can't be loaded um, at the same time. Yeah, so it will just basically auto swap. So we just go back to configuring how much. So, how much. so this is actually set by, there is this environment variable, if you look over here. So basically setting it to yes disables the one name auto swap. Basically, um, if you do this, it will fail. Uh, as opposed to auto swapping, which is what Elmod does by default. So that really just depends. Um, I think this is a site preference, but uh, um, I, I think the way it's set up by default is the right way because you don't want the user having two versions of GCC in their environment at the same time. All right, so we'll talk about another thing. Um, so in the GCC 6.0 module, um, if you were to do purge, you see this message where it says that it can't purge this module. It says use dash dash force. Uh, a sticky module is a module that can be purged the module purge, um, or even module unloads. If you were to just do module unload, GCC 6.0, it won't work. Uh, you have to do dash dash force. Um, the sticky module is kind of useful if you, for instance, have like a startup modules that you've defined and for all the users. 
that maybe supposedly set up module trees or something like that. Uh, sorry, module path for trees. And if you were to do module purge, it like undoes everything and then you don't have anything. So you can basically do that. Uh, the sticky module, basically all it is is, is, a, is a, another uh, LMOD function or Lua function, sorry, uh, that we just add in. Uh, this is what it does. And it basically, if you add this line, it will just make it a sticky module. Okay, so now we're talking about hidden modules. Um, so if you're at a site um, that um, has modules that are hidden from your environment, uh, this could be done because maybe your site administrators don't want you to see, let's see, dependent modules or like system libraries or stuff like that that really users shouldn't be uh, ever having to use. Um, you, uh, you can potentially um, see everything using the show hidden option. And perhaps maybe it could, it could be useful, um, but you know. So it may be a good try to actually uh, run this because you, you may not know what you have. Um, in our example, we have uh, one hidden module. You would see the way hidden modules are, you would see it starts with a dot in front of the module. So bzip is a hidden module. Uh, actually, you will see with the H next to the module, it shows you right here, this is a hidden module. And uh, hidden modules, don't are, you don't see them in the output of module avail. So if I were to do avail on bzip, you won't see it. So if you do it, show hidden, you see it. Even the module spider command doesn't work with that. So if you do kind of spider vz2, you won't know that it's there unless if you do show it in. Okay. Um, so yeah. So if you if you don't, if you don't remember, um, we're kind of now halfway through. Uh, another thing that could be useful, uh, if you're not sure, um, is like if you want to know how the module configuration is for a mod, you can use module config, and it shows you the entire LMOD configuration set. Uh, all of these are uh, kind of a description of the the LMOD. Um, these descriptions don't really mean much unless if you actually understand the, the configuration parameter. Um, most of these configuration parameters are in this page right here. And yeah, um, we'll talk about some of these uh, things. Uh, I think, so some of them that we, I think we talked about like auto swapping, the disable same name auto swap. Um, so that those are some things that kind of useful. Um, yeah. Okay. So I think we talked about um, the dash T that's for the, it's basically the um, machine readable, or I guess, terse output. Um, this also works with a uh, spider and also like even let's say save list. I want you to talk about that. Um, but, but yeah, they work with several sub commands. Uh, another, command that could be useful is if you want to search for a text in the module file, you can use module key. And then some text, say GCC, something like that. Um, it'll tell you that this is the search criteria and then it says that, um, you know, maybe if, I, if I'm these two modules um, that have that search key, if you say something like maybe like blue or something, you don't see any uh, module files. So you could do the module key to search for some specific uh, keyword in your module file. Okay, so let's talk about how you can debug modules. And 
some of the things that probably could help you when you're uh, yeah, understand how the module files working. So the first thing is uh, dash capital T. It's showing you a trace of how the modules are being loaded. So I'm going to, I guess, purge, first purge. Uh, do dash e load open MPI. And a trace, uh, what it will show you is the, the module file, the actual FN, which is the full name or the file where this is uh, located. And it will tell you uh, which module file is being loaded. And then the second one, it will tell you that with OpenMPI, GCC also had to be loaded. Uh, in this case, 6.0. So if you do a module list, you would see that there's two modules loaded. Right. Um, so you can use a dash capital T and it's, it, it will give you a trace of how the modules are. Um, and, and note that the way these, even though it says that OpenMPI is the first module that's loaded and the second is GCC, uh, the order of how these modules are loaded is, is different because in this case, GCC is a dependent of OpenMPI. The GCC has to be loaded first and then OpenMPI. So if you take a look at this file, um, this is, this is, well, this one is saying you want to load anything between GCC to these versions and it will load one of the GCC modules. Okay. So let's purge. So I'm going to load Anaconda 2, no, and GCC. And another useful command is uh, dash dash mt, which prints out the module tables. So let's actually run that. Um, this is a, a command that will show you the state of the modules. Uh, in, in basically Almod, there is a, a basically a dictionary uh, or module table. And it tells you some metadata that could be useful, such as the family, like, what families are set. It's just a key value pair of the family name and then the name of the module. Uh, there's this MT table, which shows you the uh, actual modules that are loaded. So it tells you that this Go module is from this file. This is the full name of the file. Full name meaning the actual module load command that you use to get the fully qualified name. It will tell you the order, the load order. This is the second one in the order. Um, a status tells you if the module is actually in active state. So sometimes you can have modules in inactive state when you change module path. Um, here is Anaconda 2. This is the first one in the, in the list. And then GCC is the third one in the list. So it's pretty useful. Uh, Empath A is just another. Um, it's basically, if I recall, uh, a list of all the module trees. So colon separate list of module path. You do echo that was in that. That's what this empath A is right here. So you see EX1, EX2, all of this. So that's what this is. Okay. So this is probably a pretty useful command if you if you want to know current state of the modules, use uh, module dash SMT. Okay. So now uh, we're going to uh, talk about module collections. So Elmod introduced uh, this concept of uh, I guess well, module collection or it's called user collection. Um, it's basically grouping a, ref, uh, a group of modules into a collection name. And this could be particularly useful if you uh, want to load like several modules as part of your like uh, workflow. And 
some batch script and uh, you don't want to type in the module load commands uh, you can just save them and then and then restore all the modules from the collection using module restore command so let's actually talk about this so, um, and see how this goes so what we'll do is we'll purge and just load some modules so gcc 6.0 and then um, and then i'll do ml save so ml save or module save will just save your modules into a collection it will tell you the collection name it says that it saves these current modules into the default collection okay so these collections are actually stored in your home directory under rd oh yeah so i must be in a yeah these are coming up from my home or so let me actually remove Yeah, so this is probably a side effect of me having module collections in Perlmutter uh, while using the shared file system. And yeah, um, so if you do ML save list, uh, it will show you the collections. Um, I actually have two collections, so I think I probably, um, sorry, let me just create another collection just so I show you what it looks like. So I'm gonna force purge and then create another collection by loading PGI and then I'll call, let's say, uh, a collection name PGI default, which, load, which just saves whatever the default module is. Um, sometimes I, I think this, this, this could happen to you. Um, uh, your site administrator may change the default version of a module and you won't know that un unless you see your script probably break, right? If you're just doing module load. So you could potentially just save this into a collection and then just always restore to avoid having your, your system break your, like system change break your workflow. Your so I think we did save list. So this shows you a list of all the collections we have default and PGI save, uh, PGI default. Um, if you want to see what the content of the collection is, you can do ML describe. So in the default collection, we have basically what tells you is the modules that will be loaded when you restore from this collection. Okay. So this has GCC and open API. Okay. And if you want to look at the other collection, you can describe the name of the collection. And this one will just load PGI. Okay. So let's actually try this. So if I do ML purge, so I have nothing in my environment. You can do ML. And I'm going to do restore and then the name of the collection. So I'm going to load PGI. You notice that it says it's restoring modules from the user's PGI default collection. If you do ML, you will see the default PGI module has been loaded. Okay, and that's the 18.1.0 or 10. Um, you can also just do module restore or ML restore, and then we'll restore from the default collection. So if you have something already in your shell, you can just restore. Uh, it will restore from the default collection name. In that case, was GCC and OpenPI. So you can always just you know switch back and forth between collections um, with a module restore. So like that, and then see, I'm back to PGI. Um, so if you if you want to know more about collections, um, you know, I would take a look at this link. 
this is basically an overview of the user collections. Um, you know, so what we basically talked about is module save, module restore, uh, and module describe. Um, so you save the modules, uh, you save modules into a collection using module save, and then you can restore, which is basically kind of loading all the, basically loading a collection and then showing the contents module describe and module save list is showing you the uh, list of collections. Okay, so now we'll talk about how you can customize the module path. So if you want to um, add or remove module trees from module path, you can just use module use to some path and it will add it to the module path. You can, uh, by default, I think it prepends. If you want to append, you can use dash A and it will append it to the tree, append to the back of the tree. Um, so let's actually start. Um, I'm going to unset module path. So this is one of those things that, that, that you can see that if you unset module path and you do module avail, you're going to get nothing. Right? Um, because there's nothing you can search. So I'm going to actually append this to the tree. Right? Expected. And if you do echo module path, this is the tree that will show up. So if you do ML avail, you only see this tree now. So that's what module path does. You can also just modify this module path variable directly, and it will do the same thing. Okay. So now we'll talk about a uh, utility called Spider. So this is a utility provided by Almod. It's basically used to help build uh, Spider cache. Um, mostly used by administrators. Um, if they basically for managing their software stack, they will use a Spider cache to provide like the most up-to-date uh, modules. But that's what the Spider command does. Um, the Spider command is actually different than the module Spider. Uh, the module spider is kind of basically used by end users, whereas spider is most used by the admins, at least from the use case. However, we'll just basically talk about what it is. So um, if you want to use a spider, you can just load the, L, the LMOD module and then just do spider. Open, you'll see all you know, the list of um, options. The one that's usually of most interest, um, so the way it is set up is you have the options and then the name of the module or, uh, or basically what that is, is the module path. Um, what we'll talk about is actually the different output formats. So there's list, uh, spider T, uh, spider JSON, JSON software pages and stuff like that. Um, they're pretty useful. Um, if you wanna see a list of all the modules, just use list and it will tell you the full path to the module files, right, as a list. And then you can actually use this as part of, like, if you want to uh, process um, the content if you want. Um, if you use uh, the other output format, let's say JSON software pages, it will show you the, uh, the content of the module file and uh, along with the description, the package, the version, and uh, even the help. Um, so this could be potentially useful if you want to document your modules as part of your documentation process. Uh, you could potentially use a spider, uh, this command and just um, stick it into, um, into your markdown or RST page. Um, and, and, it, and it will be a most up-to-date. Uh, you would, however, want to do this as like a like a recurring thing so that it it auto generates the modules as you deploy your software. Um, another useful one is the spider dash JSON output format, and this is shows you actually the metadata of uh, the module files that the spider cache has. 
And the things that, um, that like maybe of, uh, let's say that are of interest are usually things like, well, I said to talk about it. So the LMOD is the name, is the name of the software. The keyword is actually the, where the module file is living. The full name is actually how you load this module. So module load LMOD is how you load this module. Hidden is telling you if this is a, an actually hidden module. And then this is like the what is of the uh, section. Same with the uh, help. So yeah. So this, this command could be pretty useful if you want to actually know the internals of the, uh, the module file. Uh, so with that being said, um, I think we're wrapped up with exercise two. And see if you have any questions before we move on. How is everyone there? Are you able to follow on? Okay, so I don't hear anything. Um, I'm presuming everyone's okay. Um, so this section is going to be relatively short. Um, I think we'll, we will finish on time. Um, in this section, we'll actually talk about some of the um, so some of the ways that you can actually write module files. So the more functions. And for this uh, exercise, uh, what I'd like you to do, uh, if you if you follow along with exercise two, your module path is going to be messed up. So you would want to set up source of setup script, which will get you back to the original uh, module path, and you will see all the module files. And for this exercise. Um, I'm going to open up this page. So we're going to, uh, so I, when you're writing Lua functions, um, you should read this page because this is important. Uh, when, when you, uh, we're going to reference this, but uh, when you want to write Lua function, um, Lua files, um, you want to know exactly what you have available. So let's get started. So the first thing, if you want to write a module file, let's actually do a help. So the help section that you see right here, this is basically a dummy module. You use this help function and then two brackets and then some keyword text. That's what you. That's what's. Uh, that's what's used to show in the help when you do module help. Okay. And you know you can see that right here. If you look here. This is the printed out on the help command, right? And it's a multi-line string. Okay. So let's talk about another module. So I think if you do. Orange A, and then I do B. Um, so I do purge and then do B. Basically, what this is doing is this module B requires module A to be loaded first. So if you do show B, you look at the content, it says that this module has a prerequisite on module A. And it's needed to be loaded before loading this module. So if you notice what I did, I load A and then B. But then if I when I purge and then load B, A is not loaded in the environment because you have to load A first. Okay. So prereq, if you look, 
three. So it's just a list. You can have multiple modules. Uh, the current module is only loaded if all the list of modules are loaded. You can also have pre prereq any, which is only if any of them are loaded instead of all. So let's talk about uh, module complex. So I'm going to show you. See, this is a complex module. What is? It shows you that this module C has a conflict on A. Right. Let's do a row. C. So conflict is another keyword that in Lua function that Almod understands. Basically, it tells that you cannot load module A and C together. Okay. So let's try that. So you purge, you load C, it works. But let's try purging and then do module A and C. And it says that cannot load C because A is already loaded. And you can also do something like MLA and then load C, and then it will give you the same thing. Uh, if you were to purge and then do MLC and then A, this will work because when you loaded C, A was not loaded, and then you load A afterwards, and then that works. Okay. So let's purge our environment. Uh, now we'll talk about loading dependent modules. So this is something that's very common. Um, when you um, building a software stack, you will want to load um, dependencies of the software as part of your module. So that way you environment set up. So um, I'm going to do the way uh, this module D is set up is um, we're going to have dependencies on module A and B. So when you load D, it will automatically load A and B as dependent modules. And then these modules are also removed when you unload them. So let's do an purge. D. So now if you do ML, you see A and B are loaded along with D. Now I note that the order is also important because uh, I think module list just shows you the order of these modules. So A and B are dependent modules that get loaded before you load the actual code module. Let's do unload. And then if you do ML, you notice that the dependent modules are also unloaded. Okay. So now I'll talk about uh, conditional load. So this is slightly different than. It's the same example with the uh, uh, example D where you're loading dependent modules, but uh, we're going to use if statements to only load if the module is loaded. So let's. So this module file also depends on the same modules A and B. So when you load A, E, it's only going to. Uh, so there's a function called is loaded. Uh, it's just, it's just a true or false, and it, it expects a module file. And you can wrap it around an if statement and, and then say, if it's not loaded, then load it. If it's not loaded B, then load B. Okay. So, converge, read E. So, yeah, I have A and B loaded. And if I do module unload E, Notice that the dependent modules are in your shell. So with conditional loads, um, it, it's the inverse operation it, it isn't hit upon unload because the way the modules, um, the way it's written, uh, this this fu this function is only called. Uh, if the module is loaded, 
come upon those, but not upon somebody for approach. Um, so that that could be a, a something that you you may want uh, at your site if you want to have a module file that still keeps on the dependent modules. Um, so let's talk about uh, another useful thing. So you imagine you have a module file and you want to write messages to standard out. Uh, you can use the LMOD message um, function. So let's try this. We see messages printed to the screen. Says it's loading A and loading B. The way this um, module file is written, um, it's just taking on the same example E, but we had this function called LMOD message, and then it's just some string that we add to the end, uh, 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 like some str string that is printed out. Okay, so. We are in this, we talked about LMOD message. So that's what this is. And then we talked about this is loaded, which is returns true when this module name is loaded, okay? And yeah, so, okay. So now we're on this exercise. Um, so you can also define alias inside a module file. So let's actually do that. So if I purge, um, would be, um, in this module G, I've defined an alias CPU to the command LS CPU, right? So LS CPU just prints out the system configuration. So if I just do C CPU, I see the same uh, thing. Uh, so these aliases are defined in the module file. If you were to remove the module CPU and then run the alias, it's not going to be there. So the alias is, a, is also uh, removed as part of the, uh, or basically unset when you unload the module. So, so that basically that's what this is. So set alias defines a name, set it to some events uh, and that's it. And the last example we have is uh, how we can in, uh, introspect, uh, use the introspection functions uh, and also execute some Linux commands. So before I actually start that one, um, what I'm talking about is in this function, um, there are several introspection functions that you can use to retrieve uh, like more generic module file names. So like my module name, my module version, full name, the file name, shell name. Uh, you can use all of these to get really useful features. I think I've mostly just used uh, like these three maybe. Um, even this, this could be useful. So if I were to do MLH, um, it tells you the full name of the module is H1.0, the version's 1.0, the file name is this, the shell is bash, and then I'm also running some commands. So let's actually see what it's doing. So this LMOD function, uh, this, um, module file, we can define variables. So I have variables like name, f name, and we're just calling these functions. And then we use Elmod message and then print them out to stand it out. Um, so yeah, so my file name, my shell name, as you can see, shell is bash. And the other things that we can also do is we can actually execute commands. So this is another thing using execute function and it expects a command and then some mode to you want to do one. So if you take a look at what execute is doing, the, um, 
So it expects two things. So one is the command and then the mode. The mode is usually either load or unload, uh, but it could be other modes. So, um, the mode is actually this thing right here. So there's another function. It could be load on load, it could be spider avail or spider, basically whatever you're doing at the, app, uh, the, the module command that you're running. Okay, uh, that wraps up this exercise. Uh, I think this gives you an overview of some of the rule functions. Um, I recommend you read this uh, rule module files page with all the functions. Um, And I think we only have one more exercise to go. So I think this is also relatively short. So I'm, I'm going to just proceed and then we can ask questions in the end. Uh, so if you are, um, if you have a, a module system that's using, for instance, like tickle modules, um, like using the environment modules, and you want to switch to LMOD. One of the things that Alma provides is a, a, a wrapper script to translate tickle modules to Lua. So we have um, actually um, a tickle module called, in, in this case, this is a uh, dummy module ZSH, which uh, you can know that this is technical because it has this percent module. Um, and if you want to translate this, because you notice that these functions are different, if you want to translate it into um, Elmod, you can just use uh, the script called tickle to Lua. So I'm just going to just do that out. So yeah, so there's this is the um, so there's some options that it provides and it expects the name of the file and then it will just print out the, the content to standard um, to standard out. If you want, you can redirect it to a file. Okay, so I'm going to just copy this line. Um, this is basically the full path to this module file. And notice. So let me just run it again because it's going to be hard to see. So this is the content that's automatically generated from the script. You can see the what is section is automatically ended. I added prepend path. And yeah, for all these variables. And that's and then it has even this conflict. If you take a look at the actual um, of this ZSH module, you're going to notice that what we have essentially done is take this whole text and translate this. And we've taken this conflict and translated that, the prepend, and all these paths. So it's, it's trying its best to actually translate everything. Um, so, yeah, if you're interested, you could just take a look at this link. Um, and it talks about how you can convert tickle modules to. Um, so, yeah. Um, so, there's another wrapper script if you want to translate between uh, uh, shell to Lua. So, basically, if you do a help on this, uh, it will show you. Um, it expects some bash shell script and it will just kind of go to the loop. So I have a script called shell to Lua. It's just doing some exports like hello equals world equals bar. And if you want to create a module file out of it, uh, you can just, you know, just run this script and it will just set up the, in the path for you. So uh, that could be that could be useful if you uh, if you have any shell scripts that you want to convert to module files. Uh, maybe you're writing a script 
that's generic for both Tickle and Calmod. Uh, you can just have a shell script that does it. Okay. Um, I think I'm going to skip over this. We talked about dot versions already. Um, I do want to just mention there are different ways you can actually set the defaults. One of them is using the startup. Um, there's an environment called Almod underscore module file and module RC. Um, you can use that. So the way it's, it's actually is defined. Uh, the defaults could be either the default, which is the highest number, dot version, dot module RC, or dot module RC. Uh, you can also have one of the system, um, like module RC files, like just one single file, like with any of these environment variables. Um, I think even the installation directory, the module config, has a module RC file. It's like this one right here. And that defines the uh, these files. And then the functions that you can have are basically any of these. These are for all the Lua equivalent, and these are the tickle equivalent. So if you're like a site administrator, you want to have a like Elmod deployed. Um, I think a single file is probably the way to go. And you can just have all, all of your defaults and versions be in one place. Um, so we'll briefly talk about the sticky module. So I think if you, if you don't remember, so GCC 6.0 is a sticky module. So there's a function called app property. And this expects um, uh, basically, uh, this is how you um, you define um, the name of the property and then the, the type. Um, and this defines if it's a sticky module. So if you do a dash dash force purge, then that's the only way you can purge sticky modules. And you're gonna have multiple sticky modules. So we're gonna revisit family. Um, uh, also, um, so if you're gonna use family, you may want to use it on um, MPI modules or compiler modules. Like for instance, OpenMPI and MPitch both provide like, let's say the compiler wrappers like MPI CC, and you don't want the users to load the same MPI provider using module load. Uh, or maybe things like math libraries that provide like, you know, like blast and Cal or Latex or whatever. So if you um, if you take a look at the content of the PCC, we we, get, we have this family compiler. Uh, the other thing that um, that we've also said is we've set uh, variables like CC. Uh, to the uh, to the name of the compiler wrapper. So let's let's just try it out. So if you purge and load GCC, you notice that the CC is set to GCC because of the way this is set. Right. If you load PGI. And then load echo. We see the compiler wrappers are changed. So what, what we talk about is uh, so there is this concept of push environment. It's basically it's similar to set environment, which is another function, except that it has it saves its state. So when other modules are set um, and unloaded, it basically is just popping it items from the stack. So uh, when you do module load, it's just pushing items to the stack. If you're doing unload, it's popping them. And a good way to actually show this is if you want to purge and load PGI, CC is PGCC. And then if I do open MPI, you notice that 
the MPI is MPI CC, I mean the dollar CC. And then if I were to remove this module, I'm back to PGCC. Okay. So, what was it? Um, add. So, we talked about add property. So, add property is just a name and value, whereas the basically the module properties are uh, something that you define in your configuration. So it's just a key value there. Uh, the key is uh, something that you define in your LMOD RC file. Okay, so what that is, is so the LMOD RC file, if you look at module config, uh, that's this file. We cat this file. Um, so it's it's a it's a properties table, and within it there is these um, different properties that are defined. In this case, Elmod is a property name, so that's the key. Um, and you can have other properties. So, like in this case, we have another property called state. Um, yeah. So the value uh, in this case, sticky, is actually one of the values that you see. Um, if you see right here, it's actually this line right here. So what that what that shows is uh, these values. You see this S and this color red. This is what you see over here with the description. So it tells you that this is the icon that you use and then the description. Um, and then, yeah. And then push environment is just, it's the same as set environment. It just, it just saves this previous state. This could be useful. All right, um, so one other thing that we want that we didn't talk about is how you can specify module range. Um, so there's a function called between that you can use. So you take a look at what it is, between. Um, it's a range of modules that you want to use to load. Um, the name of the module, the version one and version two. Um, and yeah, it will try to load between that range. Um, in this case, the way it works is, um, so imagine if you have foo is 2.7 to 3.0, it will include up to 3.0, but not anything after that. So like 3.0.0.1 is not gonna be in there. Okay. Uh, you can also apparently do um, um, symbols like less than, either before or after the, the number, you want some kind of range. Like you want anything greater than 2.7, but less you can do that. So let's see that. Um, so we have defined this in the OpenMP I. 2.0 module and the way this is named is anything that's GCC 6.0 or higher, we can just load it. So we set between the name of the module GCC, and then this is the starting version and then the ending version. And then, yeah, we'll just, you can load that. Um, okay, uh, the last thing we'll talk about, I think it's probably the end, uh, is how you can define modules that group um, that, that, that a particular Unix group can use. And this could be useful if you have um, um, like user group modules that are available to the public. Um, this is particularly useful for uh, like license software. I know like for instance, VASP or MATLAB and other things like that, that sometimes they want modules to be only loaded by a particular Unix group. Uh, I think even Gaussian has the same thing. Um, so we have defined 
uh, a module called Go, and it's only accessible to a unit group. In this case, uh, it's the nurse staff. Uh, so our unit group is N staff. So let's actually see this module. So the way this is set up is, um, so there's a few functions. Um, we What we can do is we can get the current user environment, uh, the, sorry, the current user using os.get environment. And, and then the basically it's just the name of the environment. In this case, we can use user. We've defined that the group is, so, if this is just a variable assignment, so and staff. Um, this function, the way it's set up is upon the, the mode, which in this case, the mode is a function, um, which is, could be either like module load and unload or whatever. In this case, when it's upon a module load, we go into this if statement and then we check if the user is part of the group using user in group. Um, if you take a look at my ID, I'm part of this. Um, Part of this end staff group. So when I do module load, load, I'm able to load it. So if I, uh, so that's basically what it is. Um, I will just show you how it could work if you're not part of it. So I'll just change the, change the group name. Just run it again. Now you see it prints this message and the else. It says user cannot load this module because he's not part of the group. And then if you do an ML, you, you won't. Hmm, that's interesting. Maybe I have to fix the else. Oh, it's still load. Oh, okay. This else should be fixed. Um, yeah, shouldn't be in there. Um, okay, yeah. So I see a question. It says in the group module example, if someone is in the wrong group, the module is never oh, even though it is is loading. How would one actually prevent the module from loading? So one way you can do this is you can put the logic of the content of the, the module. Um, in this case, whatever the logic is, probably like, you know, like the path, LD library path in um, like at the end of the module file. And you could do something like if mode is load, check if the user is in the group and just print the LMOD message and then just, just terminate. And then afterwards, like, uh, you know, if it doesn't reach that if statement, then it will just do what it's supposed to do, like set the path of the library path. Um, I think for an example, like maybe like, uh, like Gaussian or MATLAB or something like that, where you have users or like VASP, where you have users that need to be licensed to use it, um, you, you would just maybe just print a message, like a my message, and just say some, some message that says, um, you can't load this module, but it doesn't actually do anything. Like it doesn't set the path. Okay. Um, I think so. Um, is there an exit error sort of function? Um, we have to check. I'm pretty sure. Oh, yeah. Exit module file. That may be it. I think you could use that. You could do os.exit maybe and say some number. Yeah, 
So I think that that makes sense. I, I think that could be something I would do in this if statement. Um, and yeah, those exit uh, statements actually just come up in the module load also. So if you do something like module load for X, where it doesn't exist, you will see a non-zero exit code. Um, that's by default. Okay, um, well, that pretty much wraps up the LMOD training. Um, is there any questions? Okay, so I don't see anything. Um, I hope you guys have found this insightful. Um, so I think as maybe some of you maybe decided to maybe use Perlmutter in, in the near or maybe um, month or so. Um, we should have this um, um, some more documentation. I think the Elma documentation will be available um, in the first documentation. So. Um, so I think um, you'll, you'll get more hands-on experience um, and yeah, so just stay tuned.